تنادينا القدس تنادينا القدس تنادينا القدس تنادي القدس تنادي القدس تنادينا الحمد لله وكفى وصلاة وسلام على عباده الذين استفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبع فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم سورة سورة النحل في القرآن أن الله سبحانه وتعالى declares and we sent down the book يعني the Quran on the O Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام that this Quran might explain all things and therefore that this Qur'an might explain that strange age when the Khilafah, the state and government in Islam, disappears. And it is replaced by something else. The modern secular state, the, re the Commonwealth of Australia. This Quran will explain that strange age when the Khilafah disappears. And for a period of time there is no Khilafah. And then the Khilafah comes back one more time. And in this Quran there is guidance how to respond to that strange age when the Khilafah will no longer be there. That explanation and that guidance have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of rahmah. And for those who search and find it and, and accept it and embrace it, Bushra lahum, good news and glad tidings for such people. They will understand the world in that age, which others cannot, and they will respond to it correctly while others will not. We praise Allah and we glorify Him this night. And we beseech him most humbly for his guidance and for his blessings and for his protection. As we attempt to address the subject, Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Before we begin, let us remind you of the announcement which is just made. By far the most important topic that I'll be addressing on this visit of mine, who knows if it's going to be the last, is the subject Islam and the International Monetary System, not International Monetary Fund. The subject of Islam and money. What is money in Islam? What is money in the Quran? What is money in the Sunnah? You'll be surprised. <laughs> that lecture which was supposed to take place tomorrow night had to be rescheduled because the hall was too small. So it is now rescheduled for next Wednesday, no longer at Black Town, is it? No longer at Black Town, but now at the Liverpool, G-Y-Y-C, whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Faiz, who brought a lovely Lebanese breakfast for me this morning, and I sat down with Sheikh Faiz and I had breakfast this morning. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him. So that lecture is now next Wednesday, inshallah, at Liverpool. But next Monday, inshallah, We'll have a repeat of Jerusalem in the Quran, which now I have the book, 
When I came last December, I didn't have the book, now we have the book. And in this subject, Jerusalem and the Quran, I'm going to give you the whole subject, I'm not going to hold back anything. <laughs> so make sure you sleep in the afternoon before you come. <laughs> Let us now begin in Allah's blessed name. What is the Khilafah? The Khilafah is state and government in Islam. What is Islam? The definition of Islam is submission to Allah. What is submission to Allah? Submission to Allah is submission to Allah as Al-Malik. In some translations in English, you find Malik as king. No, we don't want that translation tonight. We're dealing with political terminology here tonight. And so Al-Malik is the sovereign. Now that's a word you'll understand. Sovereign. Lahul Mulk, sovereignty belongs to him. And so to submit to Allah in Islam is to submit to Allah as sovereign who possesses sovereignty. To submit to anyone else as sovereign. To declare that anyone else possesses sovereignty is to say goodbye to Allah. Did you hear that? To submit to Allah is to submit to Allah as Al-Akbar. And he reminds you that he is Al-Akbar. Because every time you perform Salat, you cannot move in Salat without Allahu Akbar. Al-Akbar is the one who has supreme authority. And so the Khilafah is a state and government which submits to Allah's authority as supreme. For a Muslim to submit to anyone else and recognize his authority as supreme is to say goodbye to Allahu Akbar. Islam is to submit to Allah as Al-Hakam. The 99 names, this is one of them. Al-Hakam is the lawgiver who not only gives the law, but his law is the supreme law. And when he makes something haram, it must be enforced as haram. And when he makes something halal, it must be enforced as halal. And so anyone who submits to any law other than Allah's law, as the supreme law has said goodbye to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-hakam. This is called, in the political terminology of Islam, this is called shirk. When Fir'aun declared, and of course everyone knows what Fir'aun said, Ana rabbukumul a'la. I am the one who is sovereign. <laughs> I possess sovereignty. That was shirk. When he declared, Ana rabbukumul a'la. I am the one who possesses supreme authority. That was shirk. When he declared, Ana rabbukumul a'la. My law is the supreme law in the land of Egypt. That was shirk. And Allah punished him. 
with terrible punishment for his shirk. This then was the Khilafah, a system of state and government in which Muslims could submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-Malik, as al-Akbar, as al-Hakam. The Khilafah was destroyed. Who destroyed it? Why did they destroy it? How did they destroy it? When did they destroy it? What did they replace it with? With what was it replaced? And what is its destiny? These are awesomely important questions which very few can answer today. There is a book outside which was not written as an attack on a religious movement, the Wahhabi movement, no. It is entitled The Caliphate, the Hijaz and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. It's outside. And it answers all of these questions. Now then, let us begin the lecture as to who destroyed the Khilafah and why did they destroy it and how did they destroy it. When you read this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, and when you listen to the lecture next Monday, then you'll know that the Jews had in their heart, as they still have to this day, this conviction that it is their destiny. Even after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had expelled them from the Holy Land, even after they had lived in the wilderness for 2,000 years, it is the conviction in the heart of the Jews that it is their destiny to liberate the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule. To return to the Holy Land not as tourists, no. To return to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. For 2,000 years the Jews had this conviction in their heart that one day this will happen. To restore in the Holy Land the state of Israel of Nabi Da'ud alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. And that the golden age will come back one more time. The golden age, when that state of Israel of Nabi Da'ud alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam was the ruling state in the world. That that age will come back one more time. And so the state of Israel when it is restored, will eventually become the ruling state in the world. This was the conviction of the Jews. You and I, from the Quran and from the Sunnah, from the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we would know about the magnificent deception of Al-Masih al-Dajjal who liberates the Holy Land in 19, 19, 19, 19, liberates the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule, who brings the Jews back to the Holy Land, not as tourists, but to reclaim it as their own, between 1919 and 1948, who restores a state of Israel in the Holy Land in 1948, and convinces the one-eyed Jews that this is the Israel of Nabi Dawood and Nabi Suleiman but of course it is not, it is an imposter. But they accept it and they embrace it. And that this Israel is about to become the ruling state in the world, replacing the United States of America. Those who differ with me, who say, well, we never read this in our books. Where did he get this from? This must be false. My answer to them is just wait and see. Just wait and see. 
if this is to be accomplished and the golden age of the Jews is to return one more time and they are to rule the world how will they do it they will need globalization to bring all of mankind together as one global society and they need to demolish the Ottoman Islamic Empire which stands in their way and they will have to demolish the institution of the Khilafah which is the head of Islam if you can cut off the head then you can paralyze the body and so the attack is now launched to cut off the head the Khilafah it begins as a philosophical attack which we spoke of the, the, the first lecture here tonight no, 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 one on alcohol. And that is that you use an, I'm going to use a long word now, you use an epistemology, that knowledge comes only from external observation and rational inquiry, to take mankind to materialism. But there is no reality beyond material reality. Hmm? And then you apply that to political thought. And so out of philosophical materialism emerges a new political philosophy. What does it say? Since there is no reality beyond material reality, we can no longer collectively recognize sovereignty up there. So sovereignty must now be relocated down here. The people are now sovereign. No longer the God of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the people constitute the state and they locate sovereignty in the state. So the state is now sovereign. This is a European creation. It didn't come out of the world of Islam. Oh no. Not only is the state sovereign, but the authority of the state is supreme. And it is the state which now makes law. And the law of the state is the highest law, the supreme law. But more than that, the God of Abraham alayhi salam could make something haram. But we, the state, can change that and make it halal meaning legalize it if i am wrong get up and correct me eh? get up and correct me we can change it and make it halal meaning legalize it and that is what europe proceeded to do everything that allah had made haram they made it halal <laughs> nothing left now when they declared that sovereignty belonged to them, not to Allah, that was shirk. It was shirk for Fir'aun, it is shirk for them. When they declared that the authority of the state is supreme, that was shirk. When they declared in Articles 24 and 25 of the Charter of the United Nations Organization, which I believe the Republic of Iran has not read as yet. Uh, when they declared in Articles 24 and 25 of the Charter of the United Nations, which the Republic of Iran, oh, sorry, sorry, the Islamic Republic of Iran has not as yet read, what did they declare? That the authority of the Supreme Council of the United Nations. Is that what it's called? Security Council, sorry. Security Council. That the Security Council of the United Nations is vested with supreme authority in the world. In all matters pertaining to international peace and security, that was shirk. When they declared that the law of the secular state is the highest law, that was shirk. 
And when they declared halal what Allah made haram, meaning when they legalized what Allah made haram, that was shirk. Surah to Tawbah of the Quran. They took their priests and their rabbis as arbab, lords and gods, beside Allah. Well, Masih ibn Maryam, and they did the same thing with the Messiah, the son of Mary. But they had not been commanded other than to worship one God. La ilaha illahu, there is no God beside him. Subhanahu, glory be to him. Amma, huh? Amma, yushrikun. Far removed is he from this act of shirk. Taking your priests and your rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. Shirk, says Allah. A man came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests and the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so? To which the Prophet والسلام, replied and he said, Did they not make halal what Allah had made haram? That is their shirk. My question tonight, Lakemba, is this. If the priest and the rabbi make halal what Allah made haram and that is shirk, then if the government does the same thing, would it not be shirk? You're very quiet tonight, aren't you, Lakemba? <laughs> yeah. And so what Europe did is to launch the philosophical and political attack before the military attack. To produce that which can replace the Khilafah. And then they sent their agents, you remember Jassasa in the Tamim Dari Hadith? They sent their spies to infiltrate Istanbul and to create what were called the Young Turks, the committee of whatever it was called, in whose group was located a man named Mustafa Kamal and brainwash them, brainwash them into absorbing and imbibing and accepting the new political secularism which emerged out of Europe. Jazakallah. Jazakallah khair. Then came the actual military attack. In 1897, Europeans who dressed up themselves in the clothing of Jews, remember, they are Europeans who are parading as Jews, okay? They're called European Jews, but they're essentially Europeans. Judaism is only a camouflage. These people established the Zionist movement. The, the stage was now set. The countdown has begun for the Jews to strike. After waiting for almost 2,000 years, they are now ready to strike to achieve their long-held objective of bringing back the golden age. Centuries before this, they had struck at Europe. And over a period of almost three to four hundred years, they had transformed Europe from a civilization based on faith in Christianity to a new, essentially godless civilization. Hmm? Having done that, they are now ready to strike when they create the Zionist movement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now unveils the mother of all signs for those who have eyes to see. But most of mankind have eyes. 
Most of mankind, they have eyes but they don't see. They have ears but they don't hear. They have hearts but they don't understand. Ula'ika kal an'am. Allah says of such people, they're just like cattle. What is the sign? The sign is the recovery of the body of Fir'aun. Yes. We will deal with this subject, inshallah, on Monday night. The body of Fir'aun is rediscovered just about the time that the Zionist movement is established. At about the same time also, strange thing happens to the European Jew. He's not just making money through lending money on interest. No. The European Jew gets a windfall. A massive amount of wealth now comes his way. How? The Hadith was that the earth would yield up its treasures to Dajjal. A child was playing, a black child, was playing in a village in South Africa. And this child, in the middle of the 19th century, found a big stone, glittering stone. Child took it home, showed it to the parents. Parents took it to the chief of the tribe. Chief of the tribe took it to the white commissioner. White commissioner sent it to Cape Town or Johannesburg, one of these places, to have it examined. And promptly came the reply that this was a huge diamond. You think that happened by accident? You're living in Disneyland. No. The stage was now set when that diamond was discovered. Because now we know where the diamonds are located. By this time, Britain, the scientific and technological revolution has given to Britain in particular, and Europe in general, the technology to be able to locate underneath the earth, the earth in the interior of the earth, the diamond veins. And the technology we wish to mine for it down in the depths of the earth, technology which never existed before. And so now the southern African region becomes a cluster of diamond and gold mines. One mine in particular becomes the most famous one of all. Three months ago, I stood myself at that mine. It was the biggest man-made hole in the world, in a town called Kimberley. You heard about Kimberley diamonds. Yeah. When the diamonds were discovered at Kimberley, and in the surrounding areas, it was the biggest discovery of diamonds in history. And I would suggest to you who are young and who have a thirst for knowledge, go study this part of history because tonight we have limited time. What the Jews did using an Englishman who was not a Jew, Cecil John Rhodes. Mm -hmm. Using him as a front man, they always use a front man. But they stood behind him. And they were able to manipulate the situation and gain control of the diamonds. The De Beers, De Beers Consolidated Diamond Company emerged and taking control of the diamonds. And the Rothschild family in Europe finances now the mining operations. And the bulk of the wealth which now emerges out of South Africa land up in the hands of the Jews. In 1914, the Kimberley mine was closed down. 
because it had yielded all that it could yield, the rest that now remained was just chicken feed. Uh -huh. So they closed it down in 1914. When I went to that diamond mine in Kimberley, there were wheelbarrows filled with plastic cubes to show you, give you an estimate of how many diamonds were, came out of this diamond mine. There were five huge barrows filled, brim, heaping with these plastic cubes. That's how many diamonds they got. And these were sold in the market, the international market, at the premium price because they cornered the market through the consolidated De Beers to establish a monopoly to ensure that the price would not come down. The Prophet Islam, cursed that. When Kimberley was closed down in 1914, the European Jew now had amassed the maximum wealth he could amass at that period of time. This is just about 17 years after the Zionist movement was established. Within these 17 years, Dajjal had struck and had delivered to the European Jew this massive windfall of wealth. And so now they are ready, in 1914, to move to the next stage. The philosophical and political systems were already in place. And now the military attack. To destroy the Khilafah, you'll have to destroy the Ottoman Empire. And you cannot destroy the Ottoman Empire with 5,000 Jews in an army. You need a world war. <laughs> to destroy the Ottoman Empire. That's a tall order. So what you do is you plan a conspiracy and you stay behind so that your fingerprints are not on the crime. In other words, you plan a September the 11th. Huh? The attack play took place in the summer of 1914 when the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. In the summer of 1914, there were six major powers in Europe. And there was one dark horse across the Atlantic. No one knew how fast it could run, because it never run in a race so far. One dark horse across the Atlantic. And six major powers in Europe. They were number one, Russia, France, Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary. That's five. What's number six? Ottoman Islamic Empire, ain't no Turkey as yet. Ottoman Islamic Empire. These are the six major powers. How can you bring about a world war which would result in the dismantling of the Ottoman Islamic Empire? You've got, a good, you've got to do some good planning to do this one. When they attacked and assassinated the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand, they left footprints which led to Russia. As on September 11th, they, led, they left footprints which led to Al-Qaeda and, 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 and Saudi Arabia. Huh? The reason why, I forgot to mention this last night, the reason why they put so many Saudis on board the aeroplanes. You remember I told you about the Saudi who went to his government? He says, listen, I've heard in the newspapers and on CNN that I'm dead. <laughs> 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 it seems to me as though I'm alive. <laughs> what they had done was to hijack his identity and put it on board the plane. I forgot to mention to you last night why they had put so many Saudis. The reason for this is to attack the client relationship, the friendly relations between the United States and the government of Saudi Arabia. If you can replace this with a new relationship of mistrust and hatred and enmity, it'll now, it'll now facilitate the Jews when they launch the big war to take control of the Saudi oil, which is about to happen. Hmm? This is why they put so many Saudis on board the aeroplanes. Good. They left footprints which led to Russia. 
And so Austria-Hungary had no option but to declare war on Russia. But Britain and France already had a treaty, a defense treaty, with Russia. The Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister in Britain, was a Jew. <laughs> and so Britain and France now had to declare war in favor of Russia against Austria-Hungary. But Germany has the same racial ties with Austria-Hungary, so Germany is now forced to enter the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. So they have succeeded. Whoever planned that assassination has succeeded in bringing all these powers now in Europe into a state of war. All that is left now is what they call the sick man of Europe. Who is that? Ottoman Islamic Empire. The Khalifa in Istanbul does not want to enter the war. He knows how weak the Ottoman army is in terms of military technology. But through internal intrigue within Istanbul, the Ottoman Empire is forced into the war and a Russian ship in the Bosphorus is used as a pretext. Once the war started, that massive wealth which the Jews had accumulated is now going to be used strategically for the purpose of influencing the direction of the war to get the prize that the Jews want. What is that prize? To destroy the Ottoman Islamic Empire, dismantle it, and to cut off the head of Islam, namely destroy the Khilafah. That's the prize they after. The next prize is to liberate the Holy Land and to get the Holy Land for themselves. This is the prize they're after. Between 1914 and 1916, German submarines now make a surprise appearance into warfare. As when Israel launches her big war, we're going to see weapons that the world has never seen before being introduced into warfare. When the German submarine entered into the war, it tipped the scales on the side of Germany. And by 1916, Britain was on the verge of defeat. German submarines had surrounded and marooned the island of Britain. The French government had fallen and Germany had occupied France. And Britain was on her knees. This is the moment that the Jews were waiting for. Now the Czech is going to talk. It's called financial diplomacy. <laughs> the Jews, this is the German Jews, went to the British government and said, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. We will intervene in the war with massive financial assistance to you. Massive. And we will bring that dark horse into the race. But that dark horse didn't want to come into the race. American public opinion was overwhelmingly against involvement in the war. And the most famous American of all was not the president. He was a man who had established the assembly line for producing motor cars. And what was supposed to have been a luxury item for only the rich Oh, you could, you could see how the rich people were grinding their teeth in anger when the, this man caused the motor car to become accessible to ordinary Americans. For $700, you can get a motor car. $1,000, you can get a Model T. What is his name? Henry Ford. And this man did something else to his workers. He didn't bother about what was the market wage. No. He said, I am concerned with paying a just wage. And that market wage is not a just wage. And so he paid his workers a higher wage than the market wage. Mm -hmm. And so he won the hearts of the American people. He became an American icon. His name was Henry Ford. And he was totally opposed to American involvement in the war. But when the Jews went to the British government and said, let's make a deal, the British government said, deal. 
And so Jewish money, the diamonds of Kimberley began to roll. And Jewish money now enters into the war in a massive way. And Jewish influence over the media in the United States is now made to work. And American public opinion is being brainwashed and slowly, slowly transformed until suddenly, to the consternation of Henry Ford and so many Americans, Franklin Roosevelt declares war, and the United States enters into the war. Britain, with this newfound wealth, and with the assistance of the United States, now has a new lease of life, and the war now takes on a direction that the Jews wanted from the first place. It is in 1916 that Jassasa went to work with British spies, British spies in Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, of course, is the most well-known of them. These British spies were sent into Arabia, posing as Muslims. And they went to two actors in Arabia, two. One was Sharif Hussein, Sharif al Hussein, who was appointed by the Khalifa in Istanbul as the Sharif of the Hejaz, Makkah and Medina, in control. Makkah was under the control of an Arab battalion, but Medina was under the control of a Turkish battalion. And I wish I could understand why the Khalifa insisted on the Turkish battalion under the, under the leadership of Fakhri Pasha to defend Medina. I don't know why. So when the British spies went to Hussein, they offered him the moon. <laughs> they offered him the moon. We will liberate the land of the hated Ottoman Turks, and we will give you independence and freedom, and you will now become the king of the Arabs. Remember, Britain is not talking about Khalifa, Khilafah, eh? No, no, we'll make you the king of the Arabs. And we also prepared to offer you a little, you know what, just seven million pounds. Huh? Seven million pounds at that time is what Bill Gates has now. Sharif Hussein, the great-great-grandfather of Abdullah in Jordan now, then betrayed the Prophet Muhammad betrayed 1400 years of history of this Ummah, violated the plain and clear command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Suratul Ma'idah, in which he commanded us, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tattakhizu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya Do not take the Jews, and do not take the Christians as your awliya. Do not establish an alliance with them in which you become dependent upon them and subservient to them. Do not do that, says Allah. They are protecting friends of each other. Minkum, for innahu minhum, whosoever from amongst you turn to them for that kind of an alliance. You no longer belong to this ummah, you now join them. In Allah la yahdil qawm al surely Allah will never provide guidance for a people who commit such an atrocious act of wrongdoing. And this is precisely what Sharif Hussein did, and what all his descendants from that day to this day have been doing. But the chickens are coming to home to roost now for Abdullah. And the chickens are coming home to roost for Abdullah. When Mr. Bush attacks Iraq, then you're going to see Abdullah's suitcases at work. <laughs> yeah. It, they're all packed already, you know. <laughs> they're all packed already. As soon as Mr. Bush attacks Iraq, you'll see where Abdullah is going to be heading for. Sharif Hussein now accepts seven, seven million sterling pounds and enters into a military alliance with Britain. 
and declares himself independent of the Ottoman Khalifa. Once the Khilafa in Istanbul had lost control of Mecca and Medina, had lost control of the Haramain, had lost control of the Hajj, you pull the carpet, you pull the rug from underneath the feet of the Khalifa. His Khilafa is now losing legitimacy. Can anyone be Khalifa? Can you appoint a Khalifa here in downtown Lakemba? Can Mullah Umar have been recognized as the Khalifa? No, why not? Because when the Hajj comes, Amir al Mu'minin Mullah Umar will have to apply for a Saudi visa to perform the Hajj. <laughs> huh? And if the Saudis reject the visa, the Khalifa can't perform the, visa, the, the Hajj. All right? And so the British calculated if we can wrest control of the Haramain and the Hajj away from the Khalifa in Istanbul, then the legitimacy of his Khilafah will begin to crumble. And so this was 1916. The British spies then went to the second actor in the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, Britain has a PhD in deception. If you want to destroy the Khilafah, Okay, you have to make sure that it cannot be restored. How can you take the entire world of Islam with so many ulama and ensure that not only is the Khilafah destroyed, but it cannot be restored? That's a tall order. How to do it? The answer is, you not only have to liberate the Haramain from the control of the Khalifa in Istanbul, but you have to put it in the control of those who will not themselves claim the Khilafa and will not allow anyone else to claim the Khilafa. And so long as these people keep control of the Haramain and the Hajj, the Khilafa can never be restored. Simple, isn't it? Simple, isn't it? And so that was why they had to make the trip to Riyadh to meet. What's his name? Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. Correct name? Of course it's the correct name. Why are you afraid to mention it? <laughs> But Ablaziz ibn Saw did not control the Hijaz. So he couldn't command the check for seven million pounds. Huh? He had to be content with something less than that. So what the British offered to him was if you would sign the same kind of agreement with us and violate the specific command in the Quran and betray Allah and his messenger and betray the Ummah, if you will do that, we pay you 5,000 pounds a month. Would you accept that? Abdul Aziz says, yes. Yes. <laughs> and in 1916, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud signed an agreement with Britain. Yes which made of him a military ally of Britain, subservient to Britain. But when the Ikhwan, who were his military force, questioned him, how can you sign this agreement with Britain? And how can you accept this money from Britain, 5,000 pounds a month? Abdul Aziz ibn Saud says, this is jizya. Jizya is what they pay to me because I control them. <laughs> it was dust in their eyes and they swallowed it. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud got away with it. Massive betrayal 
And a very dangerous plan is now in place. As soon as the Khilafah is destroyed, that Abdul Aziz ibn Saud will be given what is known as the green light, something that Saddam Hussein knows about, the green light. And then he will attack and take control of the Haramain. And when once he does that, he won't make the mistake of ever claiming the Khilafah for himself. And he will never allow anyone else <laughs> to claim the Khilafah. Because no one else can take the control of the Hejaz and the Haramain from them because they are supported by Britain. And so goodbye to the Khilafah. It's gone. It can never be restored. Never, never, never be restored. So long as Britain and the United States of America underwrite the security of the Saudi state, you can never, never, never restore the Khilafah. By 1919, the Ottoman Empire was in shambles, falling apart. And a British army under General Allenby, with many Arabs and Punjabi Muslims fighting faithfully under his control, attacked the Turkish garrison which was defending Jerusalem, defeated it and liberated the Holy Land. This was a joyous day for the Jews because now the countdown is really moving forward and the golden age is coming back.